Hello, friends. This is Scott Monty. Stand by for commentary. Welcome to The Full Monty, where you'll be exposed to commentary and analysis from the week's digital news. You give us 15 minutes, and we'll save you hours. And now, here's your host, Scott Monty. Hi, and welcome to The Full Monty, an audio companion to the newsletter of the same name. Each week, I pick a couple of the more pressing issues and inject inside opinion, maybe some wit, into this 15-minute show that's sure to give you a better sense of what's affecting the industry. Maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't. But I hope it makes you think. This week, podcasting is big. And a guest commentary on starting with success. Audio is big. Not just big. Big! Podcasting rose to prominence in 2005 when the advent of the MP3 player came along. Downloadable, portable audio files became a thing and rose with the popularity of the iPod and then the iPhone. And then in conjunction with the mainstreaming of social media, particularly Facebook and the increased use of apps, podcasting seemed to fade in conversation. The younger, sexier kids were in town, and the focus was on social networks, and have you got an app for that? Not that podcasting ever went away. It just wasn't the shiny new object. What with its curious name and its less-than-intuitive access, you could say that it still isn't mainstream. But with 98 million Americans having ever listened to a podcast and 150 million being aware of the term, it's becoming more common and accepted than ever before. And more recently, the likes of Pandora, Spotify, and other audio apps like SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more, they've made their way to phones. So suddenly, there's more to audio than just iTunes. And... It's easy to use. Couple that with Amazon's acquisition of Audible, and it's easy to see why the percentage of Americans who have ever listened to an audiobook continues to grow. According to Edison Research's report, The Audiobook Consumer 2016, 43% of Americans listen to audiobooks, and the number of audiobooks being consumed has grown year over year from 5.8 last year to 6.7 in 2016. Therefore, it's not surprising that Audible advertised on a good number of podcasts to tangible benefit. Those already inclined to consuming audio content had another outlet for finding shows and books and other audio offerings that met their needs. Another cultural development that's become more mainstream in the last three to five years is the increasingly sophisticated infotainment systems in many vehicles. Audio manufacturers have developed their own apps and entertainment grids, or they've made it possible to sync your device with the car so you can bring your entertainment with you. Players like the aforementioned Pandora, iHeartRadio, and others have worked with the auto manufacturers to make their platforms available within vehicles. The outcome is a more widely available, on-demand sense of audio wherever the consumer goes. Historically, radio has been popular, and it isn't fading. Over 136 million Americans listen to radio every week, albeit more online now. But the practice of using our hearing to experience another level of information and entertainment is nothing new. Radio has been called the theater of the mind, and whether it was an old soap opera, the Jack Benny show, Little Orphan Annie, The Shadow, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt's fireside chats, we were free to conjure up any image in our minds as to the scene, the action, and the characters. 
The mind is funny that way. Even without visual cues, we'll develop mental images of what we think someone should look like, given the way they sound. Did you ever have a chance to meet a favorite radio personality, or to finally see a voiceover artist from your childhood, and you thought, that's what they look like? Another aspect to audio that makes it uniquely fit for our modern lives is that unlike videos, audio allows us to multitask. I know when I write, I put on music on Spotify. When I'm driving, I listen to podcasts. It's natural to be able to process audio while our hands or our bodies are engaged in other work. This gives brands a unique opportunity to capture the theater of the mind with podcast listeners, listeners who fully concentrate on the words, the emotions behind the words, and the story being told. It's really a perfect platform for brands, and frankly, I'm surprised that more haven't gotten into the action. For most big brands that have participated in podcasting, it's been on the sponsorship end. They've treated podcasting like any other broadcast medium, thanks to the media buying agencies that advise them. No conflict of interest there. But when it comes to podcasters being successful in gaining legitimacy through ad dollars, some wonder if Hollywood A-listers are actually stealing potential ad dollars from legitimate podcasters. According to one producer, and I quote, Shaquille O'Neal could fart into a microphone for an hour and a 100,000 people would download it, while other podcasters are putting out great content advertisers don't pick up on, because for advertisers, there's a high threshold. End quote. Well, frankly, if Shaq could sustain flatulence for an hour, he'd have advertisers coming out of it. Well, he'd, he'd have a lot of advertisers. But what about on the creation end? I still recall the granddaddy of corporate podcasts that I first listened to over 10 years ago, IBM and the Future Of. In each episode, IBM played host and brought in a subject matter expert in areas that touched on IBM's businesses. But the show wasn't a blatant sales pitch. It was about the evolution of business and society as we knew it. But since 2009... Firm's use of podcasting as social media has halved. But there's hope yet. Recently, brands like eBay, Netflix, GE, and State Farm have begun exploring branded podcasts in conjunction with professional podcast outfits like Gimlet Media. There's likely more to come. The future of audio is going to be brighter still. I hope you think it looks as wonderful as it sounds. Get your trivia skills ready for the Naked Truth. This week's Naked Truth trivia question. What long-standing cheap travel tradition is being eliminated? Answer at the end of the show. And now, page two. The following was written by Robert Rose, Chief Content Advisor for the Content Marketing Institute, and this originally appeared in their Content Strategy for Marketers newsletter. Start with success. Let's pretend for a moment. You're a general leading an army. You've been marching for two weeks straight. Your troops are tired. Morale is low. Your supplies are almost out. You're camped in a safe spot, just on the outskirts of a town held by the enemy. The word comes in from high command that you need to immediately develop a strategy to take the town. So, you put together a strategy, assuming that you'll get no reinforcements, no rest, and no new supplies. You realize that your strategy will be suboptimal, but you see it as the best option for the circumstances. Then... Just after you send off the strategy to high command, reinforcements arrive, new supplies are brought in, and word comes in that the invasion is not imminent after all. Your strategy is now wrong. 
I frequently see marketing teams plan their big content initiatives this way. They presuppose that they must work within certain limitations. They set their sights no higher than on what seems achievable within those limitations. Here's what I mean. When I facilitate a strategy session, one of the first things I ask is this. What does success look like? The team brainstorms and outlines the results of the organization that they'll achieve and the attributes of the successful strategy. Then, as we lay out the plan, limitation thinking kicks in. People list out the handicaps that will impede them, the limitations that they assume can't be overcome. We can't increase headcount. Your CMS is old and inflexible. Management takes forever to make decisions. Our budget doesn't renew until November. Everybody nods and agrees we should push the timeline out, reduce our expectations, limit the scope, and create a strategy that accommodates the limitations. This is not the way to start a strategy session. What I encourage the team and encourage you to do is to start by creating the right strategy. One of my business strategy heroes, Rita Gunther McGrath, discusses this approach at some length in her book, Discovery Driven Growth. She says, Instead of starting with estimates of revenues and working down the income statement to derive profits, we start with required profits. We then work our way up the profit and loss to determine how much revenue it will take to deliver the level of profits we require and how much cost can be allowed. End quote. In other words, instead of starting with limitations and determining the best we can do under the circumstances, as in our Army General example, business strategists must start with success, the desired result, and list out all of the things that are required to achieve it. If we start planning our content initiatives this way, we will likely find that the desired result justifies removing the limitations. We may find that executives are willing to give us more people, a bigger budget, a better CMS, or a faster management decision. If we discover that some limitations can't be removed, we can always alter our plan, move out the dates, or adjust expectations accordingly. Now, we're improvising from an optimal strategy, not from a strategy that was suboptimal from the beginning. As McGrath says, quote, Think of all your problems as a gift. Get out there and fix them. End quote. Design your strategies by starting with success. And you may find you can fix a lot more than you originally anticipated. If you have an editorial you'd like us to read on the show, please get in touch with us at fullmontyshow at scottmonty.com. For our trivia question, we asked you what long-standing cheap travel tradition is being eliminated. Well, Priceline is doing away with its name-your-own-price option for airfare. The company acknowledged the dramatic changes in behavior and technology in travel booking, and it's likely that hotel and car prices will be next. <laughs> If you like what you heard here, please consider becoming a patron of our show and support us at patreon.com slash scottmonty. And please, could you leave us a rating or review on iTunes? It would really help us out. Be sure to check out other major stories from the September 6th edition of the newsletter. Out of 140 surveyed C-level executives at magazines, 68% said that the editorial team has a role in creating native ads. Google is moving into Uber's turf with its own ride-sharing service in San Francisco that would help commuters carpool at far cheaper rates. The service will use ways to connect riders with drivers who are already along their route. And digital transformation efforts often focus on technologies, tools, and processes but the additional element of people, and particularly culture, 
make a great difference. About 75% of change initiatives fail, largely because of the power of company culture. Well, that's it for this week. With any luck, your brain's a bit bigger now. Thank you for making me a part of your week and for being exposed to the full Monty. Until next time, I'm Scott Monty, and I'll see you on the Internet. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the Full Monty newsletter and this program at fullmontyshow.com. Do you think this podcasting thing will catch on?